Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Gustavo Baderas. I am the superintendent of schools here in the Edmond School District. And again, I want to thank you for everybody, everyone joining tonight and being on these online forums. We've had a, a series of forums, and tonight's focus is on our special programs. And it's going to be led by our assistant superintendent, uh, Dr. Geslin, who's going to be taking you through uh, uh, a, a brief program and answer questions as well. So. Zoom details are available coming up for our next meeting tomorrow, which is going to be uh, focused on childcare, which is, again, another important topic in our community. So we're excited to be able to do that. And details to that Zoom meeting are found on our webpage. También uh, tiene in Spanish, I'm going to translate a little bit in Spanish here uh, for folks to be able to hear this in their native language. Tienen una opción de escuchar el seminario web uh, en español haciendo clic en el botón uh, de, de, de interpretar que está abajo en, en, en la página, en, 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 que está abajo en, su, en el fondo imperial del, de, la, de la página que, 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 que está viendo ahorita. So, si tienen preguntas, uh, me pueden también mes dar un mensaje también a mí. I'm going to turn over to Dr. Giesling really quick to talk about another opportunity to be able to access this. Thank you. Our, our um, forum tonight is also going to have ASL interpretation. So we ask for your patience as we try to speak slowly and we will be transitioning about every 15 minutes between ASL interpreters so that they can access um, this forum as well. And then secondly, we will all be turning off our videos. It makes it easier for people to tune into the interpreter that's interpreting at the time. So the only video you'll see on your screen is the person actively speaking and then the ASL interpreter that is interpreting. So thank you to Patty, our Spanish interpreter, and Marissa and Laura, our ASL interpreters that are with us here tonight. I turn it back over to Dr. Balderas for um, the beginning of our presentation and our land acknowledgement. Wait for the screen if I can. We'd like to acknowledge the original inhabitants of this place, the Snohomish people and their successors, the Tulalip tribes who once Time, since time immemorial have taken care of, hunted, fished, and gathered on these, on these sacred lands. We respect their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, and we honor their sacred spiritual connection with the land and water. By acknowledging these homelands, we're also committing to working with tribal nations to further the education aims they have identified in our classrooms and schools. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Balderas. Thank you all for, for being here tonight. Um, this has just been um, a lot for everyone who is, is living through this pandemic and has children. And then tonight, we're, we hope to address some of your questions and go through some things here in the beginning and then take your questions at the end. Um, special education services, um, we will cover as much as we know and then we will get to your questions. If we're not able to answer your questions tonight, we will definitely put those um, out. We will answer them and put them out to the best of our ability. Things are changing rapidly. Things are changing. The details that we're getting, I was on a webinar about an hour ago with some new information, you know, just, just an hour ago as to how we will deliver services this fall. So thank you for your patience and your grace um, as we work through this. And we just really want to communicate with you and hear from you. So our focus uh, for the 2021 school year is first and foremost, the health and safety of all our, our students and our staff. Um, we will be following Department of Health guidelines, um, the recommendations and guidance from labor and industries, and then along with OSPI, who is the governing body over public education in the state of Washington. Um, secondly, our focus is FAPE, free and appropriate public education and what that means for, for each of our, our, our students and especially our students who receive special education services. Uh, meaningful implementation of the IEP as it's written. We are looking to implement the IEP, IEPs fully in both in-person model and, and then some, some 
asynchronous, which means not in person, but learning that's designed by certificated teachers and staff members and delivered. Um, looking at meaningful progress, we want our kids to make progress on their goals, um, that the IEP teams, the teams that come together and create the plan, um, we want to look for meaningful progress. And if there's not meaningful progress, what are our next steps and how do we address that? We uh, think it's critical to have parent engagement, so we look to you all to um, work with us and let us know what's working and what's not working. And then lastly, continuous learning and improvement for, for all of us, for our students, for us, as we work through um, everything that's before us. Um, we ask that you put questions into the Q&A, so you can tap right on there. And we have one of our student services leadership team staff members. Um, monitoring that. After we do our introductions and presentation to you, we will spend the remainder of our time uh, answering questions. And again, if we can't get to those questions, we'll get to them um, publicly at a later date. This um, presentation is on YouTube and it's also going to be on our district website. If someone was not able to attend tonight, they can watch it in its entirety there. Um, and then lastly, the district email address for specific special education questions is listed below. That is actually will occur three times during our presentation as a reminder. It's special education at edmunds.wednet.edu. And that is a email address, a district email address that if you have questions around your child's education services or something specific like who's my child's case manager, I don't know who to reach out to. Those will all come to our administrative assistant, Pam Peters, and she will direct them to the um, appropriate um, special education manager or director or myself, and uh, we will get back to you or get that to the building level to, to get information. I know so many of the questions that you each have um, are individual. They're individual to your own child who you know and love and advocate for, and we want to make sure that we are able to support you in that. So we will get to it. Um, I would like to introduce to you Haley Edner. Haley is um, our new director of special education teaching programs. She is replacing Tim Garbert, who is officially retired as of August 31st. And so Haley will introduce her team and, um, and some of the things that we know about our teaching program. Hello, sorry, I was muted for a second. Um, so I'm Haley Etnayer. I'm the new director, as Dana said, of special education. I get the wonderful opportunity to work with Will Johnson and Joy Castillo as managers in special education and Wes Kel Keller, who um, is the manager for our Alderwood Early Childhood Center, our preschool. Um, our work is supporting programming in resource, which is formally known as learning support, serving students with mild to moderate learning needs. Our pre-K 21 intensive support and developmental kindergarten, which is serving students with, mo uh, with moderate to significant needs. And our intensive social emotional support, so serving our students with social and emotional needs. Um, I get to, that's a brief introduction. I'll talk a little bit later, but I get the opportunity to turn it over to Alicia to talk a little bit about her programming. Good evening, everyone. Um, again, Alicia Carter. I'm the director of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing and the Visually Impaired Program. And just a little bit about us. The Deaf and Hard of Hearing Program is at the Madrona K-8 Choice School and at Edmonds Woodway High School. And then our visually impaired programs start out at Hazelwood Elementary. Transition to Briar Terrace Middle. We currently don't have any students there. And then they go to Mount Lake Terrace High School. Um, both of these programs are regional, um, so we do have many students from out of district that attend these programs. Um, I'm happy to answer questions later on, and I appreciate all of you being here. So now I'm going to switch this over to Joe Callahan, who is the director of itinerant programs. Good evening, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I have the pleasure of working with our itinerant special education services program. And I'm gonna explain that a little bit more what that means. That's one of the things we do in special education a lot is have big words that and have lots of uh, acronyms. So we're gonna do that in a minute. Uh, but I also have the privilege of working with Charlotte Richardson as a manager in our program and Kate Pothier, who is also a manager in our program. The next slide. 
So just talking a little bit about what itinerant support services are, we have basically five programs. We have our audiologists in our audiology program that support students with hearing testing and hearing services or having uh, hearing needs. We have occupational therapists who work with fine motor needs and that's motor needs that mostly have to do with your hands and, and your upper body. Our physical therapists work with gross motor needs, so that's running and jumping and uh, moving about in space in that way. Our speech language pathologists uh, serve students with speech and language needs, helping kids be able to say difficult sounds that are, are developmentally appropriate and also helping them get their language needs met. And finally, our school psychologists are the folks that support disability evaluations and uh, also are supporting, especially at the elementary level, they support um, the sort of universal design of um, helping kids with social emotional learning, as well as helping kids who have more intensive needs. And then at secondary, we really work um, mostly with school students that have intensive social emotional needs. And so now I'm going to turn it back over to Dana, I believe. Thank you. So we wanted to start with what we do know. Um, what we do know is in the spring, we moved to continuous learning plans. And those were developed in coordination um, with the case manager, the, the person who oversees the IEPs for our special education student and families on what does this look like? The continuous learning plans were put into place um, in response to an emergency closure. So we are moving away from those per the guidance from OSPI, and this is very recent guidance, as recent as in the last week. Um, some districts did amendments. We chose to do continuous learning plans, and our teachers and um, itinerant staff members um, did a fantastic job of working with um, with families and parents and, and things. And like this is what this is how we think we can deliver services, and this is what works. So we're moving away from those. We want to move to delivering the IEP um, as it's written, knowing that the general education setting and the special education setting historically have been a place in a schoolhouse and now they may be a little different than that. So what we also know is that our general education instructional hours need to be 1,027 hours uh, for, for our K to 21 as an average um, for our K to 21 students. So because that's the, the same as in a regular school year, our special education services need to be with the IEP as, it, as it's written, the minutes of the IEP. So our IEPs will be implemented. I, I presume they'll look a little different in a sense that the way that the service is delivered looks a little different. Some of it will be in person and some of it like online and some of it will be not online. Some of it will be offline. Some of it will be in that asynchronous. We keep hearing that word. And I was telling the team today, I don't think I used that word until literally eight or nine months ago. So the, the, the way that services are delivered will be in, a, um, in, two, in two fashions. So an example of that might be if your child has um, in their IEP 45 minutes of, of language or um, written language services, they might have 20 minutes of that synchronously with other students, and they might have 25 minutes of that that's independent work that's been designed and given to them from their, um, their provider. So right now, there's no in-person services. Um, we are working with DOH, we are working with the labor industry, and we're also in the middle of our with our sophisticated union um, to figure out the best way to start some of those services and to get kids into our schools. Um, as I'm sure you've seen on the news, there's um, a variety of ways that schools are going about it, but starting with safety of students and staff foremost is, is paramount for us. Um, and then lastly, what we know is that we need to provide frequent, um, transparent, proactive communication with our families. Again, I go back to the, the email address that was given before and then contacting your child's case manager and IEP team and or building to ask um, about services, to inquire about what works and what doesn't work. And we're, we're going to go into a little bit more of that in, in just a second. I just encourage you to help us, help us to know what's working and what's not working so we can better serve you and most importantly, better serve um, our wonderful students. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Joy Castillo. She's going to talk a little bit about maybe some staging for um, as we bring students for in-person instruction and how we'll make those determinations and um, 
and work on that and how that process will go for us. So Joy. Hello, everybody. Um, just a reminder, I'm Joy Castillo, and I help manage our DK intensive support life skills, which we're calling intensive support and our transition programs. And we want to, we want to acknowledge um, something that we've been hearing from a lot of families and teachers. It's not lost on us that there is, a, while remote learning is a challenge for many or most, it's an extreme challenge for some. And um, I think actually, if we could go to the next slide where that is, Dana. There we go. Um, well, we're going to take just a pause, a real quick pause right now. We're gonna switch interpreters for Marissa. We just wanna pause just for a few seconds so that some of our deaf attendees can pin Marissa Foley. Thank you. And we are good to go. Thank you, Joy. Okay, no problem. Um, so what we do know right now is we will begin remote services for all students. We also have been meeting in various teams to discuss what it could look like for some students coming back even before we are in a hybrid model and, and what students um, have a more than significant barrier to learning primarily remote. So for example, um, in stage two, once we get the go ahead from the health department, um, we would be considering, for example, a student who is already in that zero to 39% Bracket, um, they're in mostly self-contained class or self-contained class, already have challenges with learning to learn. And they're considered to have significant barriers to access remote learning as determined by a remote learning screener. So what we did is OSPI gave the guidance of a remote learning screener um, to use when having the dis these discussions with teams, families. And we took a, a couple steps deeper to really ask questions about what are the challenges with access, what are the barriers um, with engagement, and what are some of the skill deficits that are really preventing um, a student from thriving or gaining skills in remote learning. So those would be um, completed with an IEP team, and we would consider um, those students coming briefly in some in-person services. Um, so I just want everybody to know that we are thinking about it. We have a bunch of different plans um, that we're sending to, um, to safety committees and um, Mara's team working for, um, to see how the, the, the health and safety of our staff um, would be affected. Um, stage three would be increasing those numbers um, with priority to services for students who have the highest need for in-person services, again, as measured by this remote learning screener that will, will guide our discussion. Um, so we're hoping that we can begin some in-person services even before we're allowed to go into full hybrid. And then we're on to Joe. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we know in some other areas. And um, one of the things that we know is that evaluations for special education for students with disabilities will be done remote. Uh, we are working on some techno excuse me, technology to make that happen with um, some online assessments that we're looking at. We're also making sure that when we're looking at the way that students will access their speech pathologist or their occupational therapist, uh, that they have will be using the same learning management system that the student uses in the general education program. So if you are in uh, second grade, you will be using Seesaw and the, your speech pathologist will have a Seesaw class on that particular platform. So we want to make it as smooth as possible so that you only have one place to go to access services and to make sure that the classes are taking place for your children. The other thing that we're really going to focus on as a part of helping us determine how uh, students are making progress and how we do evaluations is taking frequent looks at how your child is doing in terms of what we call progress monitoring. And then we also want to make sure that we are keeping track of how 
well your child is engaging and how frequently your child is engaging in the online learning that's taking place, as well as the learning that's taking place outside of the online time. So progress monitoring and documentation of engagement are really key to helping us keep track of how things are going because we don't want, we want to, we do want to keep things going. We do want to keep the learning active and engagement for, uh, for children. So I'm going to turn it over to West, or excuse me, to Will to talk a little bit more about the next slide. Yeah, as my name is Will Johnson. I am the manager for the resource programs. And as Joe mentioned, we, we can't say enough about progress monitoring. That's really our, our bread and butter of understand, understanding how well students are uh, engaging with the information, how successful they're being. And when the, in the case of resource, their ability to get into a general education setting. Uh, I wanna reiterate that case managers are your first point of contact. They are the people with all the resources. That's where the magic happens. It's like a whole cornucopia of unicorns over there. That's where you get your support. Uh, special education teachers will host a Canvas Seesaw course in addition to, special, to general ed teachers. So the special ed teachers, they'll have their own rooms that, and classes that the, special ed, the students on IEPs can go to, as well as the general education setting. Uh, any specific questions that you have, remember, please contact your case manager and then to your building and then we, we go from there. Uh, I'm gonna pass it on now to Haley at Nyer. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, so this pandemic has created an ever-changing target for us. Um, and we still don't know, um, and I think we all want to know when we will be able to have our students in person. We miss them, we miss our families, but that is just something we don't know yet. We also don't know when our hybrid model will be initiated. And then the last piece is that, um, that I just want to pause for a second before we get into questions is that we know that each one of your students has unique needs that need to be addressed and supported. And this is going to need to be done through their IEP teams, their case managers. Um, and we want to make sure that we're addressing each student's individual needs, whether it be around schedule or programming. And that um, really needs to be focused with their case manager and IEP team. Specific student questions, Dana said we'd hear this three times, so here's your third time. If you have specific student questions, please contact your school or your case manager, if you already know your case manager, or email to this special education at edmunds.wednet.edu. And now I'm turning it over to questions, Kate. Okay. I'm Kate Pothier, manager in itinerant support services. I'm just gonna be reading questions um, and having the rest of the team jump in to answer. So um, the first group of questions is all sort of related. Um, how do we know who our case, our student's case manager is? And when, when would we expect to hear from those case managers? We've got several questions with that sort of theme. Okay, I'm gonna jump in here. This is Dana Gieslin again. So, um, First of all, you could you could email us it, uh, to that the email address that has been uh, put up the special education at edmunds.wednet.edu. That's a really easy one for us to be able to answer and you know get right back to you. Um, secondly, um, our teachers contract the when they start their their work, our teachers and and um, itinerant staff when they start their work that is still being negotiated. So we don't know for sure the exact day that they will be back. Um, so it could be any time in the late late August, early September days. So I don't wanna speak directly to that because I don't know. Um, we can put that on that what we don't know slide. But if you do email us, we will pass that along to that um, to the building and make sure that we get that information. In. Or it could be that it's your case manager that your student had last year also. So we will find out and give you, you know, good information um, as much as we know. Okay. Um, and so if a family is moving to a new school, um, just want to reiterate, because there's a couple questions about going into a middle school, that again, reaching out to the school um, or that email, we can help you connect you with your case manager. Um, let's see here. Uh, doo -doo -doo, sorry, there's a lot of great questions. So I'm trying to find some themes in here. 
Um, so, Dean, I know West Keller, our manager at AECC, is not able to be here, but a um, couple questions about some updates on AECC, some social media chatter about what services might look out and any clarifications we can provide. Right now, um, like we said a, a little bit ago, all of our services are starting um, remotely. And so uh, for this year, um, our technology team is putting together um, Chromebook access and then Seesaw is the learning management system. So that access also, we, we it is not lost on us that um, remote learning for our littlest learners is, is not the most effective way to do business. So that is a group that we want to get in, in person as soon as we can. And many districts are focusing on preschool, kindergarten, first grade of you know, getting kids back in person first. Um, so it is our focus, but right now it is remote learning and um, looking into curricular pieces. Um, they're doing a curriculum review at AECC, which is the same um, similar curriculums to that are used in um, Head Start and ECAP. So lots of work being done there to make it meaningful and engage with families and those kind of things. And um, you know, to Haley's point before. It is, it's heartbreaking for us not to have our, our students and, and families in person. Um, we want that to happen as soon as possible, but also in the safest way possible. So working on that and um, as we will look and work with uh, DOH and look at those staged re-entries and, and possibly um, hybrid for, for our kiddos. Okay, um, this one may be something that we can only give some information, but um, questions about how parents will get support with understanding and using the learning management systems of Canvas and Seesaw um, and sort of uh, how they can support that if they're a working parent. I know that's a very large question, but I know it's looming for many of the participants out there. Sure. Our student learning department is... Um working to create some um, opportunities for parents to engage in learning around that and also videos that they'll be able to access um, as this learning goes on. So when you, of course, when we all, we all, those of us who have kids know that when they're little, they're going to need lots of support in accessing anything um, remotely or online or in those pieces. So we have to work with families to ensure that they have some nice training and then resources later within the learning management systems that they will be using. So providing it, the initial training and reaching out to families, again, being transparent and overt with our communications. And then secondly, letting people know where those resources are on our website, um, getting it to families, having perhaps um, you know, community forums where they can ask questions and we can improve on how we're reaching families. And then lastly, you know, there, there could be some personal reach out and, and supports that way too. Um, it is so critical that our students are able to access so that they can engage and the learning management systems a lot of times are going to be the resource to do that so we want to ensure that um, our families are um, informed and have you know opportunities to on their own time like you said Kate like if it's in the evening I'd rather go watch that video that gives me the instruction on how to do how to do this um, but our student learning department will be communicating with all families and um, following up on this. Okay, um, great. A question about, um, and maybe this would go to Haley, just um, will there be beginning of your meetings and or discussions about any needed amendments to minutes or how, how my child's IEP is going to be served? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it is a very individualized question that, or an individualized process that we're going to need to take with each student. So um, the first thing is when we hear from teachers, when teachers report back, um, your case manager will be in touch with you to start talking about scheduling and programming. That'll be the time where your team will really determine uh, how to move forward with IEP um, and any next steps. And while you're on Haley, um, a, a kind of follow-up question about progress tracking and um, what that might mean for parents and their responsibilities um, when the students engaged in remote learning at home. Um, that is a great question and actually something that we're still digging into a little bit more. Um, we want to make sure that we are progress monitoring and progress tracking our students, um, but we'll have to kind of wait for a few more things to um, unfold. Uh, in the coming days, but we will get that information out to you all as soon as we know. Okay, several questions about um, itinerant support services. So speech language services, OT, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and how those are, are going to be implemented this coming school year. 
So I'm thinking that would be a good question for me to field. Um, I think what we're going to try to do is, um, you know, we're going to use remote services and have some time where um, the therapist is live with the child and or the student and possibly a parent or someone who's helping support them at home and doing some guided practice around things that um, we're doing you know, there are their goals on their IEP. Um, again, that's something that we have to kind of work with the health district on whether we can continue to, how soon we can continue to be in person with students. So right now it's kind of the same thing that we're doing with all of our, our supports is providing it using a remote location, uh, remote platform and making that happen. Okay, thank you. And um, Joe, while I have you on, there um, is a question. There's a couple questions about testing. So first, about child find for children under five who may have, um, you know, started the process sometime during the emergency closure last year, building closure, um, and then just in general, if if testing was put on hold, plan for moving forward this coming school year. Yeah, we actually met with our. Um three to five year old t evaluation team today and are looking at tools that we can use so we can get those evaluations um, underway and in play in in progress and finished and those things are going to happen within the probably by the end of September unless there's something that we're missing that we need to wait for so we would ask for an extension when that's happening so we are putting that as a priority to get to those uh, families that are waiting in that line to see what's happened we're also looking at how um, how a, what's the most effective way for us to find out whether we need to do an evaluation or not and we may be moving forward with with more evaluations just because it makes more sense to make that happen. So if you were in the line uh, that started in on March 16th, we're going to be getting, you'll be hearing from us relatively soon, um, probably by the, at the latest, the second week of September. Thank you, Joe. This is the interpreter, Laura speaking. We're going to take a moment to switch over interpreters from Laura to my, from Marissa to myself. Thank you, and we're set. Okay, um, so Joy, um, there was a question uh, or two about both work experience and um, plans or thoughts around um, students going to voice. Yes, that's me, thank you. I was hoping you'd get to me soon. Um, so as with the rest of the district, students will start with remote learning um, we're working on what that schedule looks like um, in line with what the, first of all, start with work experience. Um, we will match that up with um, their current high school schedule, which is still being developed for the district. So they will still have class periods throughout the day with a virtual work adjustment experience. Um, and, and again, for voice, it'll start remotely. What we are considering um, when we get the go ahead is how it may look to prioritize students who are on their final year and um, could be connected to the job force um, in the spring using those community services. But right now it is full remote and our teachers will be set up to provide um, their learning experience and IEP um, minutes remotely. Um, but we'll look forward to how we can join um, the community um, and those community experiences um, and work experiences um, as, as soon as we get the go ahead. Thank you. Okay, um, maybe a combination here of uh, Haley, Will, Joy, um, and maybe Alicia jumping in too. Um, a couple questions about how to meet the social and adaptive goals uh, for students in this remote environment? And I know there's probably not one answer, but maybe provide some guidance on how teams could discuss that. I can, I can uh, start. Um, and again, it's really gonna be individual and based on the students' uh, social uh, uh, and emotional goals. And we will work through our learning management systems um, and IEP teams and our Zoom sessions to, um, to support that IEP goal. 
Um, that's our initial, it'll be very individualized based on what that individual student needs um, uh, skills building in. Anybody want to add additional to that in terms of social and adaptive supports? Okay. Alicia has something, but she was muted. Sorry, I am still learning the system apparently. Um, Alicia Carter with the Deaf and Hard of Hearing and Visually Impaired. Um, I was just in a training this morning and working on how to do social groupings and using Zoom and other platforms and including students in the classroom, including other kids with similar goals just to make them feel connected. And so there are programs, um, there's nothing like in person and we know that, um, but we will be doing our best to make sure that we're doing all of that. And then adaptive will be also working with um, our occupational therapist, our physical therapist that can really help us find those tasks that can help in the different areas of the adaptive. And so it really is working as a team and with the family included so that we can get your full input of everybody so we can meet the needs of that student. And then I just wanted to follow up on that. So the present levels um, are critical for our next steps as providers. And um, so that, that is the, the first work. Uh, there's a lot of social and emotional learning and um, engagement and um, nurturing around that. And then seeing where kids are and then um, looking at goals, making sure they're appropriate in those pieces. We, we are going to have to rely on input from families, um, concerns. Uh, what they're seeing, what they're not seeing, and then and then work from there. So being transparent and having ongoing communication with our families is absolutely critical. Um, and communication is is us getting you know reaching out to you, but also hearing from you and the concerns you have, and um, and taking a look at those goals together. And then we we spoke earlier to amendments a little bit, and um, if things need to be amended because that's not. If, if something that we were working on in the spring before that child you know, received remote instruction, then we need to look at that again and we need to get some present levels and we need to, to work together to make sure we are meeting kids where they are and taking them to that, to that, next, goal, the next space. So um, the critical work at hand is social emotional learning for all of our students, um, our general education students, which are special education are, students are first, and then also um, Whatever needs, whatever needs arise and what we know that we need to address immediately. I'll defer back to you, Kate. Okay, I'm back. I'm trying to do my mute and my video. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna answer a couple of quick questions. There's a question about if we don't have access to email as a parent, how can we contact? Um, you can call the um, main line at the school that your child attends. And if you don't know which school that is, you can call the main line at the district office and ask to either talk to somebody in special education or get help finding out which school that is. Um, there are a couple questions about um, devices and children having access to devices for their learning. Um, and I, I don't know if Dana, you wanna speak to that Yes. So, um, what, Kate, what was the question specifically? We do have a one-to-one -one, um, devices for all of our, our students, including down to preschool now. Um, our tech team is working, actually it's been um, working all summer and for all last spring and all summer in exchanging devices that weren't working or um, getting devices to, to families that didn't previously have them because their children were younger. And so we're in a one-to-one, -one, going forward, we're in a one-to-one -one model um, for all of our remote learning. There's also a tech community forum on September 1st. And they, at that tech forum on September 1st, they'll discuss the, the one-to-one devices and you can have questions in there. And then um, other things that, the learning management systems, those kind of pieces. So if you have specific questions around your child's access because of special education services, some special needs, those kind of things, then I would encourage you to contact your child's case manager or the email um, specialeducation.edmunds.wednet.edu. Um, or if it's not just around your own, your own child's uh, specific individual needs, if it's more of a global question on how do I get them or how do I exchange them, those kind of pieces that we could um, answer for you at the, at, the at the tech community forum on September 1st. 
Um, okay, let's see. Um, there's a question uh, related to what we were just talking about, but access to assistive technology for students who have that need. I'll defer this one to uh, Joe Callahan. Um, we have a lot of assistive technology and um, our, our, we have some people who serve in that capacity. So I think Joe can maybe uh, touch on this a little bit. Sorry, working on the uh, mute and the video button. <laughs> um, yeah, we have uh, whatever's on your child's IEP around assistive technology, that's going to be our first guide. And then if there are other things that are needed, again, going back to the case manager, and uh, we have uh, three people on our assistive technology team this coming year, Heidi Breslin, who is new to the school district, and uh, Melissa Peterson, who's a SLP or speech language pathologist, sorry about that, uh, who has um, been in the school district for quite a while and has lots of experience with assistive technology. And then Liz Patterson, who is also a special speech language therapist who is helping us out on that team. So again, go back to your case manager or let us know if you can't find out who that is and we'll make sure that happens and we'll set those things up for you because we do have uh, the capacity to help out in, in whatever way your child needs that. Joe, don't leave. I have one more question for you. Okay. I forgot what it was though. Oh man, there's so many questions to try and track. Oh, um, so there was a question about our overall district social emotional re-entry plan. Um, and I wondered if you'd speak briefly to that, not from the special ed, but just the overall um, piece. Right. So one of the things we do in itinerant support is we support the general education side of social emotional learning. And uh, we do have um, a re-entry plan where the focus is on in getting your child engaged and uh, excited about being in an online environment, excited about seeing their peers, and then also checking out how they're doing. And so we'll be looking at those things. And we've been working with general education administrators who are going to be working with their teachers to help them uh, feel supported. So they provide a really engaging environment for students as they come back into our remote environment. We're we'll also be looking to see if there's kids that need more than what we're providing in the, the remote environment and using our uh, school psychologists at the elementary level to and our secondary counselors at the secondary level to reach out to families, to reach out to students who maybe to lead a little bit more around that. We're also looking at focusing on social emotional learning as a big part of the first week of school. We're getting things like establishing routines. We're making sure that everybody gets their name said every session. We make sure that when they are doing work, they find it highly engagement and relevant to them. And we're making sure that when kids leave off to go off of the live meeting, that they have an optimistic closure and they feel like they're ready to come back the next time that we have an in-person in -le learning opportunity. So those are some things that we're really deliberately making sure that administrators know about and that the administrators are working with their general education teachers to make sure those things happen. Thank you. Um, Haley, would you like to address a couple of the questions just in terms of um, are there resources for childcare? Yeah, so I'll give you a little preview in tomorrow, into tomorrow night's um, community session. It is also from six to seven and would love for you all to join us there and we can um, answer uh, some more specific questions. But one of the questions came up was if your student is in uh, a child care, we are partnering with some local child care agencies and have worked to come up with agreements around the facilitation of students' schedules. So um, they are, uh, the answer is yes, there will be learning time set aside in those settings uh, with our partners that we're working with. Um, and we're working to make sure that um, they have the supports that they need similar to our families and parents um, to support our learning management systems and to um, help facilitate learning if your student is in a childcare situation. And tune in tomorrow night. Yeah, for more. Um, so I'm not sure, um, Dana, um, if this would go to you, you can defer it if not. Um, there are a couple questions just on more information on why we aren't bringing students in who have more difficult engaging with remote learning um, 
why they're not coming in right away into in-person services and also sort of around, do we have any ideas on the plans of when that might happen? Sure. So I'll start and then I'm going to defer to, to Joe. So we're working with the Department of Health closely. And um, if Mara has Mara's on our call also, um, Mara Morano Bianco is our student health services manager. And so we work, we're working closely with the Department of Health, um, Labor and Industries, and then also with our bargaining units um, around um, memorandums of understanding about bringing people back to work. Um, again, our focus is the utmost safety and health of our of our students and our staff. So when we do bring anyone back into the buildings, there's some safety protocols and different things that have to be in play. Um, and and we know that uh, many of our students struggle to engage, and remote learning is not ideal. To be clear, remote learning is probably not ideal for the majority of students. Um, so I'm going to defer to Mara to talk a little bit about. Um, the decision tree that the Department of Health has put out and what we're following in the guidance around there. And then and I'd like to turn it over to Joy to talk a, again, kind of hit on the, the, the components of um, the engagement screener for remote access and remote learning um, so they can talk to both of those pieces. So Mara first. Thank you, Dana. Hi, my name is Mara Marano Bianco. I'm the program manager for student health services here at Edmond School District. Um, as Dana had indicated, yes, in fact, we are following uh, guidelines from Washington Department of Health and our local health jurisdictions, Nahomish Public Health, um, in regards to our reopening strategies. We are closely working with our public health department in determining when would be good times to be able to reopen. Certain, uh, recent research studies have indicated that dependent on what our community transmission rate indicates will be a direct indication of what that would look like within our school environment. So we are, like I said, working very closely with public health. As our community transmission rates decrease, we will then be able to reopen our schools. Typically, we are looking at uh, 25 uh, positives within a, a population of 100,000 to be able to even consider going remote. Uh, I mean, hybrid. So my apologies there. And Joy, did you want to speak a little bit more? I know you already touched on it, but some people may have missed it or just it's it's a new concept. So the remote learning screener. Yes, sure. And and first, I, I do want to acknowledge that it's confusing. This whole thing is confusing for our team as well as we work to, to try to figure this out for our students and our families. Um, it's confusing when there's child care can happen when you know, hockey teams can start up and, and then why not in-person services for my kid who needs it the most. And, and I can tell you that we are taking that to heart and, and um, wish we could alleviate the impact that it is on students and families as soon as possible. Um, and we do know looking at that, um, even without going through the, lear the remote learning screener for readiness, um, which again goes over skills, can a student even touch a button on a computer? Can they have, do they have, um, can they do more than, um, than, than hit a mouse? Can they, um, can they access any of that? Um, do they have engagement barriers? Um, is there learning 30 seconds, 10 minutes? Um, are they able to engage in even an iPad for a preferred activity or not at all? Um, then there's, there's students who, maybe in a group home and have significant learning needs and there's, there's physically nobody able to help guide several students on a learning platform, um, nor should we expect that many of the, these families and caregivers have the training or skills. We get that. And, and the, the goal of the learning readiness assessment is to start having those conversations, start identifying those students, hopefully tackling some of those barriers even when we're not in person um, uh, to do whatever we can to help improve the experience. Um, but I, I do know that all of us want to safely begin in person for some of those learners who do really need it um, as, as soon as possible. Thank you. And we're going to take a break for an interpreter switch.
Thank you. We're ready to go. Okay, thank you. Um, Kelly, um, Moses, are you still on this call? No? He is, yes. I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> just trying to navigate through the mute button and all that. <laughs> I know, it takes a while. Um, there was just a question about accessing an interpreter as a parent um, who might be wanting to reach out to their case manager or uh, reach out to their school. Right. Um, there is a protocol for that. Um, it goes through um, Shelly Roll and district office. And um, if you um, if you request an interpreter, um, you you will receive one um, in the language that you um, need it to be in. So uh, we have a process for that. And so make sure that your case manager knows that and that we can get that set up for you. Thank you. Um, and there were a couple questions about um, seeking out uh, speech services or um, questions in terms of seeking out an evaluation and uh, at school age, I believe, rather than just the the child find. And Joe, do you want to answer that or do you want me to? You can answer it, Kate, but I'll, uh, since you've been doing such a great job looking at the questions, I'll go for it. Uh, the person to contact at your school is your school psychologist. Uh, so school age uh, families have, uh, every school has two school psychologists. Uh, one of them is there uh, most of the time and one of theirs part time. So give a call to your office manager at the school that your uh, child attends and say you want to talk to the school psychologist and they will get you started on the process. So uh, that's the quickest and easiest way to make it happen. If it's just speech, you could ask to talk just to the speech speech pathologist, but the school psychologist could also help you navigate that if you uh, forget that uh, difference. So that should help. Thank you. Okay, and Dina, there was a question um, about uh, ways to access accommodations that students might need and whether a student needs an IEP or if they can access those accommodations with a 504 for the remote learning setting. So, so was the question specific to um, a student who isn't on a 504? Correct. Isn't? No, a student who transitioned from an IEP to a 504 oh. and, and whether the 504, whether an IEP was necessary in order to get accommodations in the remote learning setting. So the quick answer is no. <laughs> so yeah, the 504 accommodations um, should be um, implemented and they may need to be you may need to pull the 504 team together to talk about the accommodations that are needed in a remote setting because they could be different um, we when we talk about 504 plans um, it is about access it's about and that is generally if we think about it in a school building setting so there may be some different accommodations that would need to be um, implemented so I would encourage you to contact your 504 um, case manager whoever whoever wrote the 504 and ask for to pull that team together and then th like there may be some accommodations that aren't needed and there may be some additional accommodations that we need to implement that the 504 team can determine together um, what might work best so yes I would I would encourage that's a team decision and what's working what's not working we have a nice little you know preview from the spring of what worked and what didn't work and so we could use that to as data like this is what wasn't successful. We need to do this instead so that so that we can access services. And I'm just seeing one that I think um, may be helpful um, that just a question about what the school schedule will look like and and I it will be individualized, but a question just about what's going to look like is Wednesday no instruction um, and how will we know when our students will be receiving gen ed and their special ed services i know that's a large one dana but our last yes. question for the night so it's <laughs> a great one great one to end on thank you kate um well first of all the schedules that were were sent out were draft schedules that were working with our um our certificated union on what that looks like so those were draft they're subject to change and then as such um special education um minutes and different things will will roll into that um, that's, that's, wow, that's a whopper, Kate. So, uh, so it's, I, I don't mean to be vague, but part of it is that's draft form. So we know it will look something like that. And again, going back to, we do have those instructional hours that we need to deliver. So there has to be a combination of synchronous, which is in person, 
remotely guided instruction and then asynchronous kind of that offline and access that we provide also that has to equal a certain amount of our instructional hours so the combination of the two and then how special ed rolls into that is we definitely want to ensure that our students have access to the general education classes and minutes that they have on their IEP along with their service minutes. So it's going to be a combination. I believe that you will see some um, specially designed instruction from special education on Wednesdays. Um, Wednesdays aren't completely defined yet, but in that kind of draft mock-up schedule, that'll be an opportunity. And then there's other, there will be other opportunities for special education service providers to deliver minutes in both in-person and perhaps um, other time so they can access it um, offline. Thank you. And that's the last question, except for um, some people are saying they came in late, didn't hear it all. And just a reminder that this will be available for a review. Sure. So we can kind of uh, wrap up. First of all, thank you all for, for being here tonight. Um, we know it's busy. We know you have a million other places and things that you could be doing. So thank you for, for tuning in. So this um, whole video and with copies of our slides and everything will be available on our district website. It's also on um, a YouTube channel, which is incredibly exciting um, for all of us who participated. No, um, but it'll be available in those two spots so that you can access it later or get it and, and pass it on. Um, and then in addition, I just want to hit on one more time. I know we've, we've said it a lot, but this web, this um, email address that's before you is a, a place where you can ask your specific questions. Um, I, have a, I have a child who has an IEP and my questions aren't about his program, aren't as, as global as they are specifically about our son, right? What does that look like for him? What do his transition services look like? How is he going to access his work site and his job coach and all of those things? So. As a parent, I, I understand and um, I'm concerned as well and just trying to you know, kind of navigate this um, and, and, and see what's to come. So if you have a specific question, again, you can reach out to your case manager and the school first, but if that if you're not getting a response or it's too early or you don't know who your case manager is or if there's um, a new case manager or whatever the case may be and you're having any difficulties at all, please, please, please use this email address so that we can get back to you. And the other places, this is a nice place for us to receive some feedback if you have other comments and concerns because um, we're here to serve you. We um, care about our students um, immeasurably and uh, we cannot wait to get them back in person. But for the time being, we are going to serve them um, as in this remote fashion. We know it's new and um, we just look forward to getting the school year started and hopefully that everything gets under control here soon and we move to a hybrid model and then full, um, and full services and we get back to kind of a regular state of being. But we appreciate you. And I know that Chris Bailey had another slide to put up to talk about some future community forums. Tomorrow night is um, the child care forum and that is at 6 p.m. And there's other community forums coming up as well, the tech forum on September 1st. And then lastly, this is a bit linked to um, apply for free or and or reduced uh, price lunches and breakfast. So if that is something that you'd like to access, please do so. I know this, is, this will be, again, a different environment, and we won't be in person to give you um, these resources as much, so we wanted to get this to you tonight. So if you have any further questions, we'll leave this open for just a little bit longer. You can throw them in the, um, the Q&A. We had over 315 participants tonight, and it looks like we're up to 130 of your questions. Thank you to our incredible team for answering. Thank you to Kate for facilitating and technology for setting this up and our communications department, our interpreters, huge shout out to you. You all are amazing. And um, if you have any last questions, please put them in the chat. We will get those to you on our website publicly. Anything we weren't able to answer tonight or anything we didn't know the full answer to, we will get that to you as well. So again, thank you for your time. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Good night, everybody.